around women seeking their own pleasure and being more open about the things that they're wanting, mm-hmm. which I have not seen previously. But what do you think is moving that? First of all, do you agree with that? But second of all, what do you, if you do, what do you, what do you think is is causing that shift? Yeah, I do agree with that. Um, you know, with you know, first and second wave feminism, where we were understanding, you know, and advocating for ourselves more as women. Um, there did become a sexual liberation in the seventies and the sixties, um, and any time that <laughs> this is kind of getting big. But anytime that you have a marginalized group who has more ownership of their own body, we call this body liberation, a, it feels for the non-marginalized group, it feels like something is being taken away. And so, in fact, when the 60s and 70s free love movement happened and sexualization mm-hmm. became more appropriate or more embraced, that's actually when purity culture happened because we want to tie back down the sexual feelings of women or of people in general and control it more. Well, I, think, I mean, I think there can be some moral, and I'm not speaking religiously, societally, there's some benefits to say, kind of hold people in check on whether it's substance abuse or sexuality or, or other, other things, because I think it has some societal effects. If people are out there having uh, children, or the, the consequences of that or what it does to marriages and relationships and families if it's sort of left unchecked. You know, so I think there's probably some religious, you know, sway. There, there will always be individuals in the church that misinterpret and go to the extreme on any sort of rule that's in place. And there are people in, in you know, whatever company you work for that, that take the rule handed down by upper-level management as mm-hmm. gospel. We can never break this. If you do, you should get fired. Right. Uh, and I think a lot of individuals <clears throat> um, are responsible for the the hardline stance against certain behaviors, yeah. more so than God ever ever was. Whether whether or not you 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 know you and you can interpret that and say oh, I should wait till marriage and that could be healthy, mm-hmm. right? But we you can look upon someone who who did not do that in the same way as someone who who lied someone who 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 sinned in another way versus looking at them as unclean and unworthy of a relationship in the future but i think is what you're getting at yeah i think interpretation or or biblical interpretation and i'm faith informed i consider myself (laughs) christian-ish at this point um i think interpretation all of biblical text and we could go into that if you'd like but um is cultural like it's cultural Uh interpretation and when we when we think when we look at like galatians or corinthians and we talk about sexual immorality um like from this side or from where i sit i see a lot of immoral sex happening inside of marriages so Mm -hmm. all of those texts that talk about sexual immorality and being defined culturally as sex outside of marriage um, don't make sense to me to be defined that way immorality what do you mean what do you mean they're not defined say it again so a lot of people use those texts to define uh, why people shouldn't have sex outside of marriage, okay. like because it says it's sexually immoral, okay. like sexual immorality is the term used, not sex outside of marriage in the Bible, typically. Mm-hmm. Um, and from I just feel like there can't there should be a different definition of sexual immorality. Like when you're talking earlier about like there should be some some standards or some way to keep people in check. I totally agree um, that there should be, you know, ways we say like what is immoral and what is not immoral. Like we should have sex that's consensual. That's a moral. No, I, and I agree yeah. with that. But my, my point is that I, I think that there's some benefits other than just anecdotal. I think there's probably some, some data that's showing that uh, both sex that's too early in somebody's development or, yeah. you know, those those types of things can be damaging to the society if it's just sort of free free right. range, so to speak. You were talking about uh, how the how the church you, you think sort of pushed down the purity culture. You, you think that that were you you were saying that you, you felt like it was male driven. Uh, I think I was I was already sort of married when it sort of hit, yeah. so to speak or unaware of it when it was hitting. Um, so I, I just being, I remember being aware that it was happening, mm-hmm. but it didn't affect me. 
but I don't, I don't know anything about the history of it, where it came from. Yeah. Well, we can, um, we can kind of trace its roots back down to the True Love Waits movement, where um, the uh, an evangelical church um, kind of got together and said, we need kind of this way to talk. We need to talk about sex, right? And so I, I think that the intent wasn't necessarily bad or wrong, um, but the impact was really tragic. So the intent was we need a, another way to talk about sex. We're going to talk about sex in within church systems. And here's what we're going to say. Don't have it. It's going to be way better if you wait until marriage, which I call the prosperity gospel of sex. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. you're welcome for that. And so they kind of made this whole marketing campaign called True Love Waits and did these whole um, events where people would come and they would sign their pledge cards and I'm going to wait until marriage to have sex and things like that, but didn't give any actual sex education. Or, right. or Other than just don't do it. Other than just don't do it. And also, you know, you need to cover your shoulders up because you don't want to be a stumbling block for your brothers in Christ. And, um, you know, that, that type of messaging um, becomes really problematic because what happens is, and this is a lot of my clientele are people who like me who grew up in purity culture. Um, what happens is if you tell a woman that her arousal or, or her body is in charge for the arousal of her male partner, it is no wonder that she feels low libido as an adult because responsibility is the biggest killer of libido. And if you feel like your body is responsible for the pleasure of another person, um, you aren't going to want to have sex, you know? Um, and so it's just really damaging a lot of fronts. Another example, which is kind of my story, I waited till I was married to have sex. I was 26 to have penetrative sex. And um, I got married in Austin in the morning because my daddy always said, if you get married in the morning and it doesn't work out, you haven't wasted the whole day. <laughs> so <laughs> I got married in the morning in Austin at the age of 26, went back to our hotel room and um, had penetrative sex for the first time. And it was terrible. It was awful. And I thought, what the hell? I thought I had waited and I thought I was supposed to have some beautiful, mm -hmm. amazing experience. And instead, it was really painful and really um, psychologically hard. And I struggled for the whole first year of our marriage. Um, and eventually... It, it remained painful throughout the first year? It remained painful throughout the whole first year because I didn't have any good sex education. I didn't know what was going on. And after a while, when your body has painful sex, after your while, your body just turns off arousal. And it's like... Well, I would think as a defense mechanism, if nothing else. Right? Exactly. It's exactly right. And so because I wasn't given great sex education growing up and because I was told the prosperity gospel of sex, if you wait till marriage, it's just going to be great. You don't have to do anything else. Um, I... I just experienced all this resentment towards my partner. And well, anger and my anger. guess is you knew that was an abnormal experience at the time. I kind of did, but a lot of people just say like, oh, it kind of hurts the first time. It'll get better. Get yeah, you yeah. need to get over tough it out. It. Yeah. Just tough it out. It'll it'll eventually get better. Like, but it wasn't. It was my body saying, you've been told your whole life that sex is dangerous and not to do it and to dampen down your arousal. Like, it's not going to switch once you sign that marriage certificate. Like, we're still going to. So do, you, do you think that your involvement then in purity culture caused this psychological diminishment of your awareness of your sexual arousal that created the painful experience? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I think if I had gotten shame-free, pleasure-focused sex education, I might still have waited, which is a beautiful choice. So there wasn't a medical issue going on? No, I went to the ob -GYN after a year, and he did a full examination, and he said, Celeste, I don't see anything physically wrong with you. I think you should probably just have a kid. And I said, that's not going <laughs> to would... <laughs> That's not going to happen, buddy. How would that? <laughs> yeah, I can't even have sex at this point. I don't, yeah. So that was actually the beginning of my career, talking about decisions. Yeah. Um, I was like, I, there's gotta be some other way. I've got to figure this out. And what I really needed was a sex educator or somebody to be like, Hey, I see that you're struggling emotionally. I see that you're struggling physically. How did you resolve this issue? Well, I was already getting my PhD in health education. So I started studying sexuality. Um, and just, I honestly, truth be told, I gave myself the education that I never had growing up. Like, Oh, these are the things I need to feel more aroused. Or these are the things I think about that aren't true for me anymore, mm -hmm. you know, that I need to let go of or 
messages from my past. Um, so I kind of deconstructed some of those messages about my body, about sex in general, and sex got better. I mean, it wasn't anything but reorganizing my thought systems around sex. What did you do to reorganize your thoughts? Um, a lot of sex education. So I started like studying and reading sex books and I was already in the process of getting a PhD in health behavior. And so I took what I knew about behavior change and applied sex to it um, and slowly just figuring out like, oh, these are the this, these are the frameworks I need to walk through in order to get aroused for sex. And I know now that I need to be really aroused for sex before penetration happens so that it doesn't hurt and use a lubricant like super easy, simple things that nobody ever taught me um, is what I taught myself. And um, eventually it got better. And I thought if I could do this for myself, there's probably other people out there struggling. I could probably help. So I would think it's one of the more challenging things to do. I think as, as humans is, is to check those beliefs because you're coming to that situation with a belief and the solution was to change that. Yes. Right. Yes. And so the, I think the challenge is, as we, as we go into any sort of decision making mm -hmm. is, is that you're, you have a framework that you arrive at mm. and for many people, they never realize that that framework is, is off. Mm -hmm. Right. So how did you recognize that that was the issue, that it was your framework in how you were approaching this issue? It wasn't, it wasn't a medical issue. It wasn't go have a baby issue. Um, there were some things you could do. You, you mentioned lube and so forth. Yeah. Um, but at the heart of it, it was how you felt about it. It was how you were approaching it mentally. How did you arrive at that? It actually took me a while. Eureka moment. Yeah. Um, it took me a while to understand that it was messaging instead mm -hmm. of just like I didn't know things. But when I started to study sexuality, I realized that I had a really limited view of sex. And so studying sex made me kind of open up my worldview like, oh, there's so much more going on here than, you know, penis and vagina for one. Um, and studying sex helped me kind of open my worldview a little bit. And then once my worldview was opened up, I thought, yeah, this, this idea over here that sex is only for marriage doesn't fit with my own sexual ethic anymore. Right. Um, that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, empower me anymore even though i still was married married to the same amazing human being but um yeah it took me getting educated first and it's the, i think the power uh, of knowledge when i think about creating a sexual ethic i think about what we believe in our value systems sometimes informed by religion um what i know like sex education and what i feel like my intuition so when we're making our sexual choices i think it's good to check in with all of those my value system, my knowledge, and my intuition. Um, and when I looked at all of those, I realized that my value system was no longer working for me. And I needed to take some things out of that basket and put some more things in my knowledge system. And my value system growing up was also telling me not to listen to my intuition. You know, you have sexual feelings, those are actually evil, right? Instead of like, you have sexual feelings? Yeah, that's normal. You're a normal 14-year-old girl. <laughs> right. Um, and so once I learned how to balance those things out a little bit better, um, my decision-making became more clear. I still use that decision-making to that, that, those three systems of my sexual ethic to make decisions about sex. You're weighing your, your knowledge, your value system, and then your intuition. And I would imagine, though, a lot of time your end goal would be able to get to a place with any sort of ethical code where those three things line up every time you have to make a decision right, right? that would be it, it would eventually become easy but i would imagine when you're establishing an ethical code that's not going to happen every time most of the time it's not ever going to happen um and then eventually you work on it so how do you get to a place when you arrived with new decisions and you're trying to weigh equally your knowledge intuition and values how do you adjust that and go, okay, maybe you made a decision to, to adjust your values. Uh, some people may. And the knowledge. And yeah, increase yeah. the knowledge. Yeah. But some people may not. They may choose to. I, you could change your intuition. You could change your knowledge. You could change values. 
how do you approach that or how do you guide people towards approach? 